As the moderator, it's my job to determine which questions will be asked in one order and try to cover all areas of interest, or as many as we can in the time. Um, I do retain the option to combine questions that are similar or address the same topic rather than repeating. I will ensure that each candidate has an equal opportunity to answer questions and enforce the rules. There is a videotape being made, uh, which is going to be live streamed on Elon Gross's website, is that correct? And we can get information about that from him afterwards if you want to get online and see that. Or if you want to tell your friends, you can get her today. So I think we're ready to begin. The candidates will now give a two minute opening statement. So we'll start with Elon, maybe get him. All right, is this thing on you? The way I turn it on. <laughs> See now. Hello. Oh hi. Where? Oh, you see it? This is magical. They don't even have buttons on these things anymore. There's got to be something, huh? Okay, wait. There's a oh wait, this one's got more buttons. Did they? They look very not. Oh wait, this little red thing in the back. There it is. Oh hello. Yeah, there we go. Look, if we can fix a microphone, we can fix the state of Missouri, too. Let's get it done. Uh, hey, everybody, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you so much to the League of Women Voters for moderating, to uh, all of the churches involved in hosting this as well. Beautiful spot we're in. Uh, I've been here a few times for some other things. Uh, but, no, I'm very excited. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Alad Gross. I'm running for Attorney General to sue a whole bunch of scammers, including those in our government right now. We've got to make a whole lot of changes in our state government. I think we deserve real leadership in our government that represents the people of the state of Missouri. That's the bottom line in this campaign. Uh, I, uh, I'm a resident of St. Louis City, so thank you for the very short drive today. Not like yesterday, I had a very long drive yesterday. Uh, but I live in Carondelet. I grew up in University City, went to Clayton High School. Uh, this is my 20th anniversary of our state championship football win this year. So very excited about homecoming in October. Yes, thank you. Uh, I didn't play very much, if you can't tell by the size of me. But uh, no, I, I, I served as an assistant attorney general of our state when Chris Coster was our attorney general. I've seen what that office can do when it's working for the people of Missouri. I intend to get our consumer protection division working for us again. I will start our first civil rights division in the history of our state. I will bring back the conservation and environmental division to protect our drinking water in the state of Missouri, and we will make sure that your attorney general is working for you and stops wasting taxpayer money. So uh, very excited to answer all the questions here today and uh, very excited to be your next attorney general for the great state of Missouri. So thank you all for the time. Thank you all for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Monroe. I'm an attorney here in St. Louis, Missouri, and I will tell you I'm a lot more uh, comfortable on that side of this table than this side of this table. Uh, I am not a politician. I know that sounds funny because I'm on the ballot and that by default makes me a politician and that is as uncomfortable as I get. I am comfortable in a courtroom. I litigate for a living, I make arguments for a living, and I do family law, the least paid, most conflict-ridden area in our legal system, which might make you think what makes you qualified to be attorney general. What makes anybody qualified to be attorney general? And that's having a bar degree. That's the lowest standard I think we can all have. It's sad that three people that have met the, 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 the minimum standard, and I get a little uppity in one get together with friends, and next thing you know, I'm on the ballot. <laughs> so let me first apologize for being here to all of you. And let's hope that we have a spirit of debate because, quite frankly, I think that you will find Mr. Gross and I probably don't vary as much as we think. We shouldn't because a lot of the social issues that Mr. Gross believes in, you will find that I actually agree with. The libertarians tend to be socially liberal and physically conservative, which that's kind of why I ended up as a libertarian that no one else would have me, I guess. But the first thing they did was they said, would you run? And I said, you know, I'm not a libertarian, right? They said, we don't care. <laughs> I also had to say I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I feel like both parties have left me behind. I am stuck in the middle 
without a land and without a party to represent me, so I guess I have to represent myself. And that's how I ended up on this stage today. So I want to thank you guys for having me. Thank you to, to the League of Women's Voters and Mr. Gross. It was a pleasure yeah. to be yeah. this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody asked you again that you hold your applause to the end. Um, okay, we're going to start with some questions that were formulated by Churches Together, members of the Churches Together for Justice. And uh, whenever I get some uh, audience questions, I will start putting those in here too. So our first question is, first a statement, kindness and justice for all are two of the values integral to the work of our churches. Given the divisiveness in today's world, what are the most important things you will do to bring kindness and justice for all through the Office of Attorney General? I'm going to ask Mr. Gross. Sure. Um, no, it's an important question. Uh, I think, look, there are so many folks around the state of Missouri who do not know who their Attorney General is. There are folks who have no idea who this guy here who's not even showing up today is. And I think that's such a big problem because there, it's so hard for us to build community when you have somebody who doesn't even want to work for you. So we've been traveling a whole lot. I've had this truck for a little bit over a year made right here in Missouri, and uh, we've got 55,000 miles on this thing because it's so important for us to meet with folks and to make sure that they're being heard. And that doesn't just mean Democrats. I mean, I'm running as a Democrat, but I've got support from folks who run Trump headquarters in Warsaw, Missouri, because it's so important. And I think, you know, what your point was is exactly right. There's so many people who've been, who feel like, and they have been, left behind by our government. And we need folks in our government who want to include all of us. So as Attorney General, I will make sure that your communities are heard, that you know who your Attorney General is, that you have direct input in that office, because that's what you deserve to have. And I think that that will make us a much, a much kinder and more understanding society overall. You know, I think that justice is an interesting term when it comes to the court system. Uh, you know, they stand for justice, they're supposed to apply justice, but really they're answering systems. They are rooms where you present evidence in a very specific way to a very specific person who makes a very specific rendering. They give an answer, and we hope that it's just. But justice really means an equal application across all socioeconomic backgrounds, again, no matter who you are, it applies equally to everyone, rich, poor, male, female, however it comes out, all the laws apply equally. And I think that that really is what the Attorney General's office should be doing, is making sure that when it comes down to defending Missourians against scammers, one of Mr. Gross's big you know, points, it should be defending all Missourians, not just the high publicity, not just the ones, not just the ones that get you into the Republican or the Democratic or Libertarian newsletter. Everywhere, regardless of who they are, because they live in the state. This is a related question, and I'm going to start with you, Mr. Monroe, so you can probably follow up a little bit on this. How will you ensure justice for all? when the Missouri legislature continues to suppress the freedoms of large numbers of Missourians. Among others, examples of these freedoms would include voting rights, reproductive freedom, and LGBTQ rights, especially those of trans people. In 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't believe government should be in a lot of areas of our life. Most importantly, our doctor's office. You know, where do we draw the limit of government? And that's really an important distinction. I think between the Democrats and the Libertarians, or maybe not, but certainly between where I stand. And I don't think that the wheels of government should be involved in the private lives of our citizens. If a doctor and a person wants to make a personal decision about their private health care, then they should be free to do something. And I've never been a politician yet that's smarter than a doctor. So I don't know why they should be making doctor, you know, doctor decisions. Most of them have law degrees. You don't want me dispensing medicine, I promise you. And I don't want them deciding about your medical care, certainly amongst the, I don't know what the other issues were that were mentioned there, but I have only 30 seconds. So that's the best I can get to. Okay. 
Yeah, look, I, I agree. Uh, I'm a small government guy, and we live in, at a time in Missouri where our government is abusing its power so much, and they're trying to tell families how to live their lives. As Attorney General, I will start Missouri's first fully staffed civil rights division to protect our civil liberties from an abusive government. We need that. We need that here in Missouri. Most other states have one, and Missouri still doesn't. So uh, that will certainly deal with a lot of these issues, but we just had an attorney general who tried to take away our right to vote, who tried to block us from using the initiative petition process that we have a right to as Missourians, and I will certainly uphold those rights here in Missouri. This will go to Mr. Curtis. This is that good thing. Yeah. questions here with just two candidates, but... Um, what brought you to the decision to run for attorney general? And we're asking, they are asking this question because in the past, the attorney general's office has brought lawsuits on behalf of the state that neither relate directly to Missouri or sometimes more obviously seem to be brought for personal political gain. Well, not just the past, it's happening right now. I, we're not gonna do that. Uh, look, I, I, I'm running because I work there I fell in love with that office because we had so many folks who could have made so much more money working somewhere else and they chose to serve the people of Missouri. And there's so much that the Attorney General's office can do, it breaks my heart that people have no idea who our Attorney General or what our Attorney General's office can do for us. So no, certainly I intend to get that office working for us again and it's about time we stop wasting crap on these bad lawsuits. I mean, they're terrible lawsuits. And we need, we need real leadership in an office to change that. So, um, no, I'm running because, look, I, I know what the power of that office can do. I've worked with kids for a long time here throughout the state. I think they deserve a better future. They deserve real leadership that looks forward to saying, how can we make sure kids have real opportunity in the state of Missouri? And I think that if we come with that same lens of how do we serve all Missourians, how does our attorney general become our attorney, that's how we get real results of that office. Thank you. Well, let's see. Um, I got asked, and I, I tend to find that I end up in the right spot. Don't know why. Uh, I ended up in law school because the job I was working, which was a manual labor job, it was we had a family uh, business, was going away. And I was given the choice, which a lot of people don't get that choice, but I was given the choice of do you want to try and retool or go down with the, down with the ship? I retooled. I went to law school, like my mother told me I should have done 10 years prior. Okay. Don't anybody tell her, and don't anybody send the link to her, please. She loves it when I say she was right, and she was. But I find myself sitting here today because I said yes. I said yes, I'll do it. Partially because I had a lot of these conversations sitting on my screen and porch out back my house. And all of a sudden someone said, we know a guy with a bar degree that will help us keep access to, this, to the, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, ballot. Having three parties on that ballot is so important, you guys. You cannot believe we have had two super majorities in the last 30 years and neither of them have gotten us anywhere. And everybody says throwing away your vote on the libertarian ticket is throwing away your vote. Maybe it's time to throw away your vote to both parties that it's not okay what they're doing to us anymore. And that's why I sit here today. Thank you very much. Missouri Attorney's General, Attorney, Missouri's Attorney General serves as the chair of the Governor's Crime Commission. As such, what is your view of the school to prison pipeline? And what will you do as Attorney General to mitigate or begin to solve this racially institutionalized problem? And so Mr. Monroe, let's start. This is a question about the school to prison pipeline what would you do as Attorney General to mitigate or try to solve this racially institutionalized problem? Thank you. I, I don't know if I can answer that question specifically, but I can tell you one of the areas that I have been um, very serious about promoting as Attorney General is making sure that we are operating at a higher level than the bare minimum standards of the ethics for, um, for lawyers. And part of that means that one of the laws that rules that Missouri has not put into place that I would immediately make sure we are following is model rule 3.8. And the, what that stands for is that there's an innocent man in jail or you come to find that there is, is um, uh, evidence that the prosecutors have to actually go and start defending that person to get him out of jail. 
I don't know why Missouri hasn't enacted it. But that's going to be the first thing I tell everybody is that we don't operate at the minimum standard. Just like at my, at my law office, we don't operate at the minimum. We operate at the maximum for our clients. And if Missouri is my client, I will operate at the maximum and everybody underneath me will be expected to do the same. Yeah, I, well, one, I agree with this. Uh, two, when we're talking about violence in our communities, uh, I was on a task force that was called the School to Prison Pipeline Task Force, uh, changed to keep kids in class, if I'm getting that right right now. Don't yell at me if I didn't. But it's, it's about making sure, you know, that there's, there, there are folks who look at the numbers of kids in third and fourth grade and reading levels and then decide about prison construction. Maybe we should just educate our kids. Maybe we should start doing that. I think that the Attorney General should be an advocate for the people of Missouri, too. I think we need to start talking about our education system. We need to have a real plan to deal with violence in our communities. We need to have one that's more than just prosecutions are important. Law enforcement is important. But by the time somebody makes that decision, someone has been hurt, uh, someone has been killed, a family has been torn apart. We need prevention, too. And that should be coming from a coordinated effort at the Attorney General's office. So I certainly intend to work with a lot of kids like I have throughout my career. Career, but to make sure that our communities are involved in the process of rebuilding our, our communities all throughout the state. And I think that's a really important part of that, too. Thank you. This is somewhat related to that. Uh, when, or would, when or would you intervene to stop executions that have gone through the courts, execution orders that have gone through the courts, with filings uh, by groups like the Innocence Project? So, Mr. Gross, you get to start that one. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, we've had, look, we had Sandra Hemi, who was in prison for 43 years for a crime that she didn't commit, and our attorney general opposed releasing her. We had Christopher Dunn, who was in prison for 34 years for a crime. A judge four years ago said he shouldn't be there. And our attorney general, in both cases, called the prison warden and told him to ignore court order so that they would stay locked up. On our, and we're paying for that. So no, we're not going to be doing that anymore. We're going to have a civil rights division that makes sure that people are not being abused by their government. That's why we need one. That's why I talk about it so often. So look, the, I think the Innocence Project, they're doing a lot of good work. We've had other states that have worked with them from the Attorney General's office to actually make sure, just like you said, that folks who are in prison should be there and folks who shouldn't should be out. And I mean, it's, it's that simple. And I don't understand why this guy has decided differently, and he's doing that with our money. It, it's, it's, if there's no other reason, that should be reason enough to change who our Attorney General is right now. Yeah. I'm totally kidding. Um, I, I agree with almost everything he said. The one thing I really don't agree with is that following the same path of enacting more commissions to do more things, enlarging the footprint of the uh, of the uh, Attorney General's office is the right way to go. But that's probably where the rubber meets the road between Democrats and Libertarians, honestly. Or between where the Democrat Party left me kind of in the dust. I don't think sitting around the table is going to get things done anymore. You need somebody with a fresh look. You need a non-politician to come in and say, I don't know this job. I don't know this company. But let's see where we're operating efficiently and let's cut that out and cut out the things where we're not operating efficiently. Let's try and get the most help with most people in the most transparent way and try to actually do what we're there to do and that's to serve the people of Missouri. I don't know if a civil rights commission is the right thing or not, I really don't. Mr. Gross seems very sold on it. But I don't think enlarging the footprint of the Attorney General's office is the right thing. I think that the Attorney General's office already has too much on its plate that it doesn't do right. Why put more on the plate? Okay. What are your thoughts on recent book bans in schools and public libraries? And what do you feel is the proper role for, there's a lot of things here, A, parents, B, school administrators, uh, school boards, librarians, and the government in general, and in general, how should the Attorney General be involved in these situations? So I think we'll start with Mr. Monroe. Okay. I don't think you I can repeat you. Yeah, there was a lot of questions. <laughs> lot. I, just I think the first, first part to think about is how should the Attorney General be involved in, should 
and how our house shared the attorney general be involved in things like book bans in schools and public libraries and if not the attorney general who well for first of all i'm not angry i'm not in favor of any movement period uh, you know that's the most ridiculous thing i've seen in, in, in 47 years living here it, it seems like i'm living in a different country sometime when i'm sitting there looking in florida and you know seeing that they're banning books I, I agree that parents should have control over what's coming in their home please by all means parent children i don't want to parent your children i've got my own two kids that are at home right now not wanting to be here i don't want you parenting my kids any more than you want me parenting your kids so the government shouldn't be involved in in, in being big father big mother big parent or big whatever Try not to get into copyright infringement there. <laughs> but what we should be doing is we should be supporting the parents to, to, to take those active roles in their children's lives as best we can. Whether or not that's a legislative issue or an attorney general issue, I don't know. But I know that I don't want to parent your kids. I don't want you parenting them. Uh, look, I, I don't support these book bans. I think, I believe in local control. I don't think our state government has to be telling all of us how to live our lives either. But I think that local government's really important for a reason, and we should be preserving that in Missouri. But again, this goes back to why a civil rights division, I'm not talking about a commission, is so important. I'm not talking about expanding how big the attorney general's office is. When I worked there, we had 200 assistant attorneys general working for you. Today, we're at about half of that number, and it's not because they don't have the budget for it. It's because they don't have the leadership to retain people in that office. People don't want to work there because of all the stuff that's happening right now there. So I'm not proposing to expand the... When we have a consumer protection division that's fully staffed, we're bringing money into Missouri. When we have a civil rights division that's fully staffed, we're bringing money into Missouri. When we have an environmental and a conservation division that's fully staffed, we're bringing money into Missouri because we're punishing those who are violating and exploiting the people of the state of Missouri. And so I'm saying that we need to get that office focused on preserving your rights under the Constitution. That's what a civil rights division would do. <clears throat> You said bail system, correct? Yeah, I think so. So the, we we reformed the bail system a bit here in Missouri, not to the degree that some other places have. Um, and so there's a question. I've represented people who have been locked in St. Louis City jails uh, who did not commit any crimes. They were there because they couldn't afford to get out. And they spent. I represented a young girl who was uh, 18 years old, and she spent seven months there because she couldn't afford $100 to get out. For 15 of those days, she wasn't even charged with a crime, and they just let her there. They dismissed the case against her until I represented her. I think that there's a lot of folks that if you are being kept in, in jail because you are poor, that is a debtor's prison, and those should not exist in the United States of America in 2024. If we're talking about somebody who is a danger to society, we're worried about that, there are other ways to make sure that we keep those folks in there. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about with a lot of poor folks, and those are the people who so often are being screwed over by our government. Another reason why we need a civil rights division to make sure our rights are being upheld in the system. So I think that bail is certainly a big part of that as well. Thank you. Mr. Well, I can't agree more. I don't think somebody should be held in jail because of the poor. I certainly think that the wheels of justice should operate equally for rich and poor. Regardless of who you are, they should operate equally. The bail system certainly impacts, as it sits right now, it impacts poorer families more than it, it, it impacts richer families. If that's going on, it needs to be adjusted. So, but there's a lot of things out there that need to be adjusted, not just the bail system. That's such a small area, an easy area actually to approve. And, I, and that's, I absolutely support it being approved because it's so easy to be done. It just needs to be fixed. Thank you. Um, here's another one regarding the uh, legal system. Currently, formerly incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people must complete their entire probation and parole before they can register to vote. Would you favor having the law changed to allow registration immediately after their release? So this is... Yeah, 
I mean, I'll take it if you want. I got a one word answer on this one. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, but it's not going to be one word. So, let that take me down against his time. That's fine. I see it to you. Yes, I see it to you. So, one of the things I learned, I don't know if you guys can hear me, one of the things I learned when I started looking at whether or not I was actually going to run that I found out was that the people that are in jail actually count towards the, the, the population to represent in, Los, in Jefferson County, or in Jefferson City. One of the things that we fought the British on for 250 years ago was taxation without representation. Why are those people not allowed to vote, or why are they being counted? One or, the, one or the other. If they're being counted as a head to give power to different counties because they're in jail in that county, then give them the right to vote for their representatives. Simple. This is a 250-year-old debate that we're still having in the middle of this country? Silly. Just silly. So yes, and then. Okay, and, and Mr. Gross, was there anything more you wanted to add? No, that, I, I, I stand on my yes, yes. <laughs> I'm going to give you this next one to start with. Sure. A little bit longer. Uh, at least seven people have died in the South Central Correctional Facility in Licking, Missouri this year. Last year, 19 men died, about 14% of the total deaths in all Missouri prisons. There are ongoing reports of abuse, neglect, corruption, and an active drug trade in the South Central Facility. As Attorney General, will you commit to investigate the ongoing crisis, crisis at the prison in Licking, Missouri, and hold prison leadership accountable? Yes. Look, I've been, I've been to that prison. Um, I've actually uh, slept in the Dairy Queen parking lot when I was an Assistant Attorney General to save you all some money, so you're welcome. Uh, yeah, the, um, uh, look, that, that's actually where Christopher Dunn was housed before he was released. Um, that, look, there's, and it's not just licking. We have problems throughout the institutions that we have. Um, I'm a civil rights attorney, a constitutional attorney. I get calls about this stuff all the time, unfortunately. We need, there's a lot of money that we're all paying because the Department of Corrections in Missouri, one, they need some more support, they get paid so poorly to work there, but two, there is very little accountability, it's including with the Sunshine Law and the Public Records Law and what we all can see as taxpayers. So yes, I certainly intend to uh, reform that, to, to investigate a lot of what's happening there, and there are folks who need to be held accountable. Another reason why I believe a civil rights division is so important, because we do need, our attorney general needs to be the watchdog in our government, and we need to have the folks there to hold people accountable when they do the wrong thing. Thank you. Yes, like I said, there are going to be a lot of differences, especially when it comes to social issues that Mr. Gross and I differ on. Um, Please choose the mic, or is that stop? Is okay. working? Okay. It's kind of in and out. I'll just yell out. Thanks. Maybe not. <laughs> Equal application under the law, or of the laws in the state, include those working in the Department of Corrections and police officers. It shouldn't be us against them. It should be us for ourselves. If police are committing crimes, if Department of Corrections are committing crimes, they need to be investigated and prosecuted just as if they were outside of those institutions. There shouldn't be any favoritism for those institutions. There shouldn't be any bias against them. Those institutions need to be given the resources to do their job correctly. We, they are terribly underfunded. We can pick almost any of our institutions and say we're getting what we paid for, and we pay poorly. So we, if we want to start fixing issues, we probably need to start applying the laws equally and start paying what we expect to get. Because right now, we're not getting even what we're paying for. And we pay very poorly in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, if you were to create a civil rights division, to what extent would that be dependent on the legislature for enacting and funding it? In that, what would what would it, in your opinion, be doing? What would be its responsibilities, Mr. Monroe? I did. I did. Um, this person is asking to create a new part of the AG office, like a civil rights division. What to what extent would that be dependent on the legislature for enacting and funding? And what would its responsibilities be? 
I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I will tell you that's one of the things that always drove me nuts about politicians. They get up here and they tell you they know the answer. <laughs> you know, my father was a very successful business person. And the thing I learned between the two of us as a lawyer is I got taught to say, I don't know. And I get rewarded for that. In fact, the first thing he said is, I don't know. Give me $5,000, I'll have an answer for you on Tuesday. <laughs> that was actually in law school. And I think it's better to have someone sit here and tell you, I don't know the answer to that, than yeah. tell you they know the answers. Because the answers aren't that easy and they aren't that readily available, especially in a one minute time here. The reality is, is that I don't know if a, uh, if a civil rights division is the right approach or not. But I'm telling you that right now, is that I don't know. He seems very sold on that, good for him. I think you need to be sold. But I think that equal application doesn't require a civil rights division. It requires someone at the top that holds the people working for them, the 200 assistant attorney generals, accountable for how they apply, who they prosecute. Well, that was a really good trap you set for me because I'm about to say I know the answer to this. Uh, whoops. Uh, yeah, so, so look, at, at the, the structure of the attorney general's office can change depending on who the attorney general is. When I was there, we had multiple divisions, the Consumer Protection Division, I proposed a civil rights one. Uh, when uh, Josh Hawley came in for his brief time there, it changed to two divisions, similar to what we have in the federal level, uh, where you have a civil division and a criminal division. Eric Schmidt kind of accelerated that. So bottom line is the attorney general can decide the structure of the office. Do you need the legislature to do something? I mean, the legislature is the one that has power over the purse and funding and all of this stuff too, so that's important if you need more funding for it. Again, I'm not asking for any more money. I'm just asking for better leadership and better use of the money that we already have at the Attorney General's office. Instead of filing a lawsuit against New York State that even the Supreme Court said, what in the world are you doing with Missouri taxpayer money? Maybe let's use it to actually benefit the people of Missouri. Would I, would I create any new divisions? Yeah, I, I, yes, I absolutely would. Uh, so civil rights division, I would have a fully staffed civil rights division at the attorney general's office. We used to have an environmental and agricultural division that Jay Nixon started, that Josh Hawley got rid of. I am bringing that back. And that is so important, especially for folks who live in this area, because we have nuclear waste that right now the, the federal government has left us with, and they hid that from us. And we have nobody at the attorney general's office right now fighting to protect our families. We are going to change that when I'm attorney general. We're going to protect our drinking water throughout the state. If you live near a meat processing plant and you're worried that thing's going to rip and get into your drinking water, well, you're going to have an attorney general on your side making sure that's not happening. So I will definitely bring those two divisions to the attorney general's office with me. You know, I don't necessarily disagree with the way it's, it's organized right now. I mean, the, the, the way that the courts are organized is criminal and civil. I don't know if divisioning things off so that you're concentrating on one thing over another another is the right <laughs> means much. You know, it sounds good. It makes a good sound like, but what does it mean on the ground? I mean, he, he didn't have a freedom of speech division to sue New York. I agree, that was so. Like, Supreme Court like, agree. Yeah, really but the point is, is that he had a civil, there's a civil division, a criminal division, is that's the way the courts are like. That seems to make sense to me. I don't know if there's going to be another, if under me I, I, I have other focuses. Certainly consumer rights is one that, that is a big one for me because it seems to have been ignored and it impacts the most of Missourians with the least amount of money. The reality of this is we have a lot of Missourians being scammed out of their hard-earned money when it comes to these robocalls or even just, you know, these, these uh, contractors that go disaster to disaster and just trying to soak up what little money we have, and then not give back what they 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 said they were going to do. I think the attorney general could do, could pull a lot of weight and do a lot of good for individual Missourians with that kind of focus. Um, okay, Mr. Monroe, this is a continuation of some of the same questioning. Um, you say that increasing the footprint by creating a civil rights division is unnecessary. Do you feel it is unimportant to have checks and balances in place to protect citizens from government overreach? 
Uh, I think he said it may be unnecessary, but I don't want to get <laughs> stuck on semantics here. What a here. lawyer. What a lawyer. <laughs> um, yes, check, it, look, checks and balances are one of the most beautiful things that we have as Americans that we started. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have one, you know, area of government to have veto power over the other area of government. We need that. We desperately need that. And we need that more now than ever because the, the weights and balances, the checks and balances have, have started to become a little, you know, more concentrated in certain areas, uh, especially in the, in, in the executive branch, which oddly enough we're running to go into. But I think that having the legislature and the executive branch at war with each other and not necessarily shaking hands and, and leading each other down the aisle is better because I don't think they serve the same purposes. They serve different purposes when they talk about serving the people. And if they're both doing the same things, then something's getting undone. Thank you. Mr. Gressner, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so look, I think um, within those, so the way that I'm, I'm looking at this, right, is you have divisions, the reason being is that when you hire attorneys who learn a lot about that practice, learn a lot about that area, they can specialize in that area, that benefits us, right? It costs us less money to have somebody there who knows what they're doing in those divisions. For example, in the Civil Rights Division, one of the units that I want to have there is a specialized unit that focuses on public corruption to make sure taxpayer money goes where it's supposed to go. And we used to have some of these things when I worked there. We used to have an agri the environmental division had folks who specialized in that area. Now they're all gone because they don't do that anymore. And so we don't have anybody representing us on those issues. And what's so interesting about our executive branch here in Missouri and so many other states, we elect an attorney general separately from the governor. The attorney general is a check within the executive branch. We shouldn't have an attorney general who's the attorney for the governor or the attorney for big government or the attorney for the big corporations that are donating to that guy. We should have an attorney who represents represents us, and that's what we need at the Attorney General's office. Yeah, look, we've got the Second Amendment Preservation Act in Missouri that is the stupidest law, one of the stupidest ones we've ever passed as a state. What it says is it defunds police departments that work with federal agents to deal with violent crime. I, what are we doing? We used to have laws in this state that if you were going to have a gun, you had to go get I've done this. I've gone through concealed carry training. And to think now that there are people who are carrying on with no training whatsoever, you just, you want to know how stupid that is, go to a gun range and look up for two seconds. I mean, those are people who are there and they're starting to learn how to do this. And we've seen what happens. We saw this in Kansas City. We've seen this in so many areas of our state. But right now, yeah, we've got some really stupid laws in the books. That one is unconstitutional because it's a violation of the Supremacy Clause. More money that we're throwing out the window to hear from the federal courts to say, oh, by the way, Missouri, your attorney general doesn't know what he's doing. And I think we just need to stop with this kind of stupidity because at the end of the day, it is wasting our money, it is making us less safe, and we need to do the exact opposite of both of those things. I believe that the Second Amendment allows us to bear arms. Certainly, Missouri is one of the more um, open about firearms. Whether or not I agree with it or not almost doesn't matter as far as sitting here as Attorney General because the people have spoken on a lot of this. There's a legislature, there's a, the legislature has, has voted on it, there's the Constitutional Amendment on it. Quite frankly, I, I, whether or not I agree or not, I like guns, I have a gun, it's not for me to tell you, I don't think government should be reaching into your private lives again. This is probably an area that Mr. Gross and I are just going to disagree. But I will tell you, if the legislature enacts something, the Attorney General's office on review will be enforcing it. Okay. Thank you. This is a question about Amendment 3. Um, I have a couple questions about that that have come in. If Amendment 3 passes, uh, what will you do to stop lawsuits that would sue organizations like Planned Parenthood for trafficking minors for abortion um, and to block um, any other groups or any political parties from uh, blocking this amendment? 
as they have with others. So I'll just start with Mr. Donovan. When Amendment 3 passes. <laughs> when it passes, the Attorney's General Office will no longer be a puppet for MAGA Republicans to try and get their voice out there. And that's it. No longer will the Republicans and MAGA Republicans specifically have that input into your private lives. First of all, that's what the amendment says, so why should the Attorney General's office do anything different? Now, one thing that may, may curl everybody's hair, or may, especially on my side here, is that I grew up in the back of Planned Parenthood with a mother of manager. Mm -hmm. Why are we not providing for health care for women? Mm -hmm. This is an essential element to poor women specifically that don't have access to health care anywhere else. Amendment 3 is the right thing to go for. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I, as a libertarian, I agree because I don't believe government should be re reaching in. But why should we be treating one half of this country differently than the other half? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, have to, I, I agree. Absolutely. Look. It, it, yeah, well, it's, it's going to be, look, I'm, I'm clapping here. Uh, look, um, Amendment 3 is, is very important, and there's another reason why this connects to the Attorney General's office. When Josh Hawley was there and when Eric Greitens was our governor, they gave the power to the Attorney General's office to prosecute abortion crimes. Okay, so if you're, we're talking about big government and how we shouldn't have it, especially in this kind of area here, I mean, they are talking about using state force state force against women in Missouri. I, I was debating the other, what, this guy who's not here right now, he doesn't know if he wants to protect IVF. There was another one who was saying that, oh, maybe we'll prosecute women who have miscarriages in Missouri. This will put reproductive freedom into the state constitution and we need an attorney general who is going to enforce those rights that we have when Amendment 3 does pass. And so, heck, Either one of us is going to do it, sounds like. But we need, we need to get this done. So it's so important to vote for Amendment 3, but it's also so important to vote for an attorney general who's going to enforce it. A lot. Uh, look, you ask the Attorney General right now, you ask him, how much money have you wasted on these lawsuits that have gone nowhere just to get you on TV? So you don't have to talk to the people, apparently. The answer is, I don't know. I don't track that number. Well, we're going to start tracking that number because, one, we aren't going to have these stupid lawsuits at the Attorney General's office anymore. But, two, that is absolutely ridiculous that there's not going to be any oversight from the legislature on how much money this guy is wasting. It's our money. You want to talk about more wasted I mean, just look at any of these lawsuits this guy is doing. Look at all the people that he's keeping in prison right now, and we're paying for it. Look at all of these things that he could be doing, suing scammers, going after these folks in our phones, making sure that our health care system is working for us, enforcing antitrust law in Missouri so that these big companies aren't screwing over our communities. You want to talk about government waste? This guy is bloated government. And he won't even show up to answer the people's questions. So we're paying that salary, and he's not even showing up for us. Talk about government waste. Goodness gracious. Sorry, you got me fired up on that one. Whoa, buddy. I, I believe the question is, can I point to a tax that I think should uh, be answered? Is that right? What do you think? What do you think? Where is the wasting money going? And what would you do to the question again? Uh, essentially, it's... How do you feel money is being wasted and what would you do about Government budget is an extremely complex issue that can't be answered in one minute. It just can't. There's no way to do it. The reality is, is that government is a little bit of a shell game, but it's almost like a shell game with someone that doesn't know where the ball is themselves. It's not that there's this huge conspiracy to hide money, it's more like just the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. I think that getting the people out of office that have been there, wasting them, and putting new fresh faces in is super important. Making sure that third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties have a seat at the table so that 
all citizens feel represented by who's there is really super important. I said there's an independent in a, in a, in a party that I don't even really own as my own, mm -hmm. own solely to keep their access on the ballot. That's how serious that is. And I think that the more we can allow for transparency and accessibility, the better off you're going to be in making sure that your tax money is well guarded. Okay. Thanks so much. This is a question about Medicaid. Um, will your Medicaid fraud control unit vigorously investigate and prosecute abuse and neglect on behalf of residents in Missouri's long-term care facilities? There's some additional questions here about, um, it's a lot here, but uh, how to employ, train, and provide resources to the Medicaid fraud control units. Would that be Mr. I'll take the fraud part at least. I think I can answer that one. Yes, fraud is fraud. It should be prosecuted. It shouldn't be limited to just Medicare fraud. But Medicaid and Medicare fraud um, should, should certainly be at the top of the at the at the, at the top of, of the, it's a big area that can be hit and, and quite successful. There's clearly a lot of waste going on in that area, uh, and it, it can be more efficient to use. We we provide plenty of money for it. It can be used more efficiently if the fraud if the fraud is cut down. I don't know if you can cut it out 100%. The reality is we live in a society where there are wrongdoers. The more you prosecute those wrongdoers, the less you encourage other wrongdoers from doing it. So where there's fraud, it needs to be addressed, and the Attorney General's and Attorney General's office would probably be the best place to handle that, and certainly would be a focus. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's certainly the place because, I mean, by statute, that's the Attorney General has to enforce Medicaid fraud, right? So uh, I, I knew the people who were, the, they do great work on behalf of Missouri. We need more of them to go after all of the stuff we're having. And especially in a lot of the senior homes around the state where there are so many abuses. And now because our attorney general isn't doing his job, you're seeing billboards and advertisements from private attorneys who are saying, call me because I'll do it for you. Just like what they did uh, in, in the boot heel where folks were suing Tyson because they, they, they abused their power in the, in the system and they screwed all these local farmers over. They had to sue on their own because our attorney general wouldn't do it. That Medicaid fraud unit is so important when you talk about Medicare as well. We've got these Medicare Advantage plans that are screwing people over too. A lot of these folks, maybe some of you have gotten some calls on them too and, and people are, are paying for things they didn't know they were getting and now they're, they're out in the hook and they don't know what to do. As Attorney General, I'm going to explore all of these issues in our health care system to make sure that you are not getting screwed over, whether that's a big insurance company, whether that's the federal, or whether that's the state government. Oh, no. Did, yeah. We could do it again. I mean, yeah. I had a good time on that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will do it very well. So I will start, I, like I said, I mean, I keep coming back to the Civil Rights Division, but it's so important because we need accountability within our government. And you, okay, if you're a resident, I assume we're all residents here in Missouri, you have a right to access the ballot, to collect signatures, to put issues that you care about on the ballot. And that's in our state constitution. And the legislature can't just take that, you have to vote that away. And at one point, they were going to ask you to do that. And they did, because they know that the power of the, of the state of Missouri belongs to the people of the state of Missouri. And there's not going to be folks here who are going to say, oh yeah, you guys are doing such a great job. How about we don't do it anymore either? They need to be checked. Our legislature needs to be checked. If our legislature was functioning, if they were doing a good job, we wouldn't have to go to the initiative all the time. But they're not, and we do, and that's why we have it. And as Attorney General, I'm not going to be beholden to them. I'm going to be beholden to you, and I'm going to make sure to protect your constitutional right to access the ballot and the ballot initiative. To me, this is about money. Politics is about money. I am not beholden to any special groups. I've received zero money. $322 is what my campaign costs, and my campaign manager is a 22-year-old who is taking a midterm tomorrow and couldn't be here. <laughs> She's doing it solely for a letter of recommendation. And she'll figure out what I'm going to say. 
I owe nobody anything. And I think it goes back to that kindness question. Caring better, not necessarily more, maybe a little bit less sometimes, but caring better about what's going in front of Why is it anybody, why is anybody fighting that to begin with? Because we have a law that says if enough people put together, uh, put together a, a petition, they get to put something on the ballot. Well, if that's what the law says, let them do it. What, where's the argument? That's what the law says. Maybe we need to be worried more about why people don't want that to be a thing. Where's that money coming from? Who has that person and politician in their pocket? Thank you. Thank you. Kind of a specific question here. Uh, a couple more and then we'll go to our closing. Uh, can the Attorney General help with class action suits against companies such as telephone companies by which are forcing higher monthly rates for Wi-Fi? And I think it may be a larger question in terms of uh, class action suits against corporations in general. Mr. Monroe. Yes, I, I think that, you know, for corporations that come to Missouri, it, it's, it, it's got to be a reciprocal relationship. The people of Missouri have to get something out of it. The corporations have to get something out of it. You can't stymie corporate growth. Otherwise, we have no jobs. We have nobody here. But they can't just use our land, use our people, and walk away scot-free. They've got to pay taxes, they've got to follow the laws of Missouri, and they've got to they've got to play fair. And when they're not playing fair, that's when the state of Missouri should get involved. Because they get involved in, in, in favor of their citizens against these large corporations that really, an ombudsman isn't going to do. Somebody at their, at their help line isn't going to help you. So when that happens, the, you need the state, of, the state of Missouri to get behind you as a citizen to help you against these large corporations that don't really like to play under our rules. They don't like to accept subpoenas. They don't like to get paperwork. They, I love, when I beat Amazon in the courtroom, and I've done it multiple times, I love it. It's my favorite. That's good. That's good. Yeah, uh, so, so for class action lawsuits, okay, those are brought on behalf of you know, a large group of people. You all are going to court. The attorney general does, it, it's a little bit different. So the attorney general, one, can enforce what's called the Merchandising Practices Act of Missouri. That's our consumer protection law. So if a company is violating that, you are suing on behalf of the people of the state of Missouri on our interests, but not on behalf of a class of people. That would be a separate lawsuit, sometimes also brought under the Merchandising Practices Act. The other end of that, too, is antitrust law. So bust the trust, Teddy Roosevelt. We need to get back to doing that. But that's when you've got these huge companies that control so much of the marketplace. And oftentimes, we see them colluding on prices, price gouging folks. Uh, you've seen this at Dollar General pretty recently, where you think you're buying something for a price. You go to the cash register. You go home. Your receipt says something totally different. And they're making a whole bunch of money. And then they maybe get a slap on the wrist because you, as an individual, don't have the power. The attorney general does and can bring lawsuits on behalf of the people of Missouri. So I think that that's an important role for the attorney general's office to play. Oh, yeah. Let's go. So Liberty Bell is here. She's actually in the hallway because she's fussing right now. That's uh, my little rescue dog. They turned into a cartoon. She was rescued from a puppy mill. Missouri is number one for puppy mills in the entire country. And for those who don't know this, there are these abusive facilities. She's got a broken arm because oftentimes they have these wire cages where they get stuck, pull you out, throw you back in. They don't care. She was there for two years. We've had her for two. She's only bitten me a few times. So she goes around the state. People know her more than me. Uh, look, we passed Proposition B over a decade ago to say we don't want those darn things here anymore. The legislature said we know better than you when they changed it. Again, another issue that we have to protect. We have to protect your voice in government. So right now, yeah, we have to reform those laws. And as Attorney General, I will be an advocate to do that. But we also have to enforce the ones that we have right now. Working with federal agents who are inspectors. Working with state inspectors. Working with shelters. Heck, I, I met someone at a Trump rally the other day who does this on a national 
national scale. They go undercover and they bust these things. So we will be working with community members to do this too. But that will serve. She's going to be the deputy attorney general in charge of puppy mill enforcement. You'll come visit her anytime at Jeff City. Mr. Monroe. Well, bring my dogs with me today. <laughs> okay, you can borrow them. That's okay. <laughs> uh, look, I have two dogs at home and a cat, Paul Bunyan. <laughs> <laughs> the kids named everything. Uh, we have Susie Greenberg, Paul Bunyan, and Jax. That's great. That's great. That's good. <laughs> Among other things I didn't think I'd be discussing today. <laughs> uh, if we have a law on the, on the book, it needs to be enforced. And part of the issue that we're dealing with is that we, we enact these laws, we, act, we enact these amendments, and then the legislature kind of shrugs and doesn't fund it or doesn't fund the investigation and the attorney's general's office turns a blind eye to it. Now, I, it certainly would not be one of my, you know, one of, one of the things I would make a hallmark of my administration is the public thing. However, it's clear that there's a law already on the books that needs to be enforced and it needs to be enforced vigorously, just like all other laws. If we said we didn't want these in the, in the state, we shouldn't have them in the state. Pretty simple, you know? I mean, it's, it goes kind of back to allowing people to be responsible, but if they're not being responsible, they need to be prosecuted. Okay, thank you. And we're, we're almost up to our time, but we have so many good questions. I do want to go just a little bit longer, and then we'll go into our closes. So I have two more serious questions. Um, so this would start with Mr. Monroe. Uh, what are you going to do about charging released inmates for their stay in prison? And the example was given from someone uh, from the St. Louis Post Dispatch article today that Mr. Bailey has frozen former inmates' accounts and is suing them for their uh, expenses in prison. We're not supposed to comment on anybody in particular, so I won't. However, I did. <laughs> I don't know what the chip is on the shoulder. I really don't. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm all the one for having a chip on your shoulder, but have it for the right thing. You know, you got a person that's already in jail, that's been prosecuted, that maybe they're, you know, uh, legally, maybe they're, you know, not, you know, with procedural issues. There's people in jail that didn't do what they were charged with and convicted of. We should be just as concerned about them as citizens as we are about the citizens out here. I mean, when, a, when there's a victim and there is a perpetrator, both sides need to be respected still. That doesn't mean that they all just lose respect because you perpetrated a crime. But there are also the victim sides that need to be considered. And I think when it comes to the Attorney General's office, they shouldn't be so focused into getting into where a uh, prosecutor and a defense has an agreement and it didn't have the death penalty. So I'm gonna go get the guy you know, put on death penalty. But what an egregious state on Mr. Dunn. I mean, all of these items that Mr. Bailey has focused his attention on to get reelected is kind of anti-American when you think about it. Was it not? Was it not Franklin that said better that a thousand guilty people go free or go free and one than one innocent person be in jail? Was it him? Did I get that right? I think he, I kind of acted up. He's around there, yeah. yeah. But that's that's 250 years yeah. ago still, and we have somebody going out of his way to keep an innocent man in jail for one extra day. It's not inappropriate. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, no, I agree. You're fine. Keep, keep going. Uh, look, there's, there's a law, and I think this is probably the reference because I think Tony Messenger wrote a bit about this too, called Mira, which if you have a certain amount of money in your account as a prisoner, they will then, the state can then sue and take that money above that threshold away. And think about it like this. If a prisoner sues for a violation of their civil rights, okay, because this happens sometimes. We talked about some of the problems in some of our institutions right now. They win a whole bunch of money, and then the state sues the state that just paid them a bunch of money, sues them to get it all back. Where's the accountability in that situation? So, look, I think that that law is unconstitutional. It's actually being challenged right now in court. I think they will succeed. I think it's a violation of due process. It's also being enforced unequally. So sometimes he's doing it, sometimes he's not, uh, especially this guy here. So, look, I think, I think that that's a law that, that will probably be struck down, hopefully very soon. But uh, either way, that is up to the attorney general whether we're going to file those lawsuits or not. I don't think that they're appropriate because I think they're unconstitutional. Okay, um, I'm going to start with a closing question, then I also will 
what you think about a closing statement. This is just a question with a brief answer. Um, what are the three top words you would use to describe yourself? And please tell us how they relate to the work of the office you are seeking. Mr. Gross. Three, three, three words three, to describe three, myself? Three top words you would use to describe yourself. Whoa. Uh, uh, well, this feels like a, like a, you know, interview question. Uh, I guess I'm being interviewed right now. All right, one, probably energetic. I've been told that a lot this weekend. Uh, and that's really important because we have a lot of work to do, folks. Uh, two, um, you know, I think, I think it's really important to have compassion within our government. I think that's so important. And to have somebody who wants to understand that, wants to spend time with people, wants to answer folks' questions and understand, like, where are we all coming from, especially in the legal sphere of things when you're representing somebody and we're all asking to represent you. Uh, three, um, uh, I guess when I'm driving, I'm very persistent because I have a lot of places to go. So that's really important. I think hardworking is really important, too. Look, I think that that's, that's kind of the bottom line. We're trying to hire somebody who's going to use our money in the right way, who's going to go and make sure we're not wasting taxpayer money, who's going to make sure our government is working for us. So um, I guess I'll, I'll use those. I mumbled through three, so hopefully I got three in there at some point. But I wasn't counting. Yeah, good. <laughs> Mr. Van Rauer, yeah, try to use the mic if, it, if it's working. Yeah. I'm going to do my best. Um, first of all, I'm honest. I can tell you that almost everybody I've ever worked with will tell you a couple of things. One of them I won't repeat right here, just because it will count. Uh, but I will say one of the things that they also say is I'm aggressive, I'm honest, and I'm driven. I see a goal and I drive towards it very, very quickly. So it was hard for me to take up a position under a libertarian banner when I know the odds are state's not going to elect you, right? I mean, that's, that's what everybody says. But you'll never hear me say a dishonest word to you. I might mistakenly say something when I only have 30 seconds, and I, which I, you know, I get something out and I'm like, wait, I wasn't a lifelong public school member, but I can tell you this. I will always tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. And that, that's really what I tell people when you're hiring an attorney. That's what you want. When you got bad news, at least make sure you have the courage to say you got bad news. No politician in their right mind would give you the bad news all the time. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. There were some terrific questions from the audience. There's a few that I think are repetitive. Um, if I didn't ask, ask you a question, perhaps you could go up to one of the candidates afterwards and ask that. There were some that kind of elaborated on topics that we had already covered. So we've gotten through most of them, um, quite a few in fact. So now we're gonna ask the candidates to give a final two minute closing and then we will go on to uh, have a reception. And uh, why don't you use the good mic for this, Mr. Monroe? <laughs> <laughs> so we can all hear you. Okay, we're ready to go. They look evil. They do. <laughs> they look evil. Looks can be deceiving sometimes. All right. I have nothing written, nothing planned. Okay, I, I, I show up and put a mic in front of my face and my lips start moving. So, I really would like to represent the state of Missouri. I really understand because I have a mother who is a staunch Democrat, a father who is a staunch Republican, not a MAGA Republican, but I've grown up in the household and I've heard everybody talk about wasting your vote with a third party, about how I'm taking votes away from Mr. Gross, and you're probably here with a lot of stickers on, thinking, geez, I don't want to vote for this guy because I like Mr. Gross. And the reality is, is that that's the same mentality that we have been fed by the same two parties that have not been representing us well. Consider for a moment the last time the Democrats really got on your side instead of their own. Consider the last time the Republicans, if there are any in the room, got on your side instead of their own. I will tell you this, I don't want to be senator. I don't want to be governor. I don't want to be anything else, not now or in the future, than attorney general. I'm not here running for the next step. I want to go back to my law office when my, when my time is done and continue to practice law for families. I love family law. I love it. It's not because I couldn't do anything else. It's because I feel like that's where you really get in touch 
with what families need working with domestic violence victims and victims of abuse is not easy it's the hardest thing you can do most lawyers don't want to touch it because it's too feely i love it it's what i actually want to do to begin with then i found out what it did was and i loved it even more I started practicing family law on, Creek, on, on the Creek Reservation in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I continued it all the way up to St. Louis, and I will tell you this right now. If you hire me as your attorney general, you will be well served by your attorney. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Here's the good mic. Oh, sorry, can I, may I borrow the good yeah, mic? Yeah, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank um, you. I got to tell you, your, your story is one that I hear a lot, and it's folks who feel like neither of the parties is serving them. They feel left behind. There are lots of places where I go. It was in Montgomery City the other day, and there was a lady who said, I remember when people who were running for office used to come here and ask for our vote. And it's been a long time. And I got to tell you, uh, when I left the Attorney General's office, um, I started working with, you know, I mentioned this, the civil rights case. I sue people in our government. I sue people who are Republican. I sue, I sue people who are Democrat. Because there's, unfortunately, a large contingent of people in our government right now, regardless of party, who care more about their power than they do about doing their job. I don't believe that the Attorney General's office should be a partisan one. I think it should be a nonpartisan attorney who represents the people of Missouri. That we should, when we're having this election, that people should show up, they should answer your questions, and at the end of the day, you hire the person who's going to represent you the best, regardless of party. Because if we start electing folks who all they care about is this team or that team or whatever else it is, then when they get there, they won't do their jobs for you. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now today. That's exactly what we're seeing. We have an opportunity to change that. And in November, I've got a great day to do it in November. We have an opportunity to say that we're done with this, that we want somebody who's going to be a watchdog for us, that we want somebody who's going to listen to us regardless of where we live, regardless of what we believe, who actually wants our input in our government. And that's what I'm offering today. So I hope I have your vote in November. If not, I'll stick around. Maybe you'll get my dog to convince you otherwise. But folks, I am super excited about the opportunity that we have in Missouri because we know what a great home this can be for every one of us because we've done so many great things in Missouri and we can do it again. So my name's Alad Gross. I'm running to be your attorney general and appreciate your support. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> hey, great job. Great to meet you. For such an energetic and interesting uh, forum today, I want to thank all of you for such interesting questions and for making this a successful event. And I thank our hosts and also the volunteers from League of Women Voters. If you found these forum, this forum to be useful and want to have more of them, think about joining the League of Women Voters. Men can join too, and uh, we have a table out in the hall, or make a modest donation if you appreciate the free services we offer to educate voters. We have literature and volunteers to help talk with you about that. Make a plan to vote. Check your registration online at the Secretary of State website, sos.mo.gov. Learn about the candidates and ballot issues by consulting the voter's guide that is published by the St. Louis Post-Dispatch with the help of the League of Women Voters. That will be distributed on October 17th. It goes online, I believe, one week prior to that at vote411.org. And of course, don't forget to vote. No, early no excuse absentee voting begins October 22nd at satellite offices in St. Louis County, and it runs until Monday, November 4th. The polls will be open Tuesday, November 5th from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And remember that you need a government-issued photo ID. In St. Louis County, you may vote at any polling place but you will receive a postcard in the mail indicating which ones are closest to you. Thank you very much for your attendance.